Good evening, my friends. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Tom, and the color cast is on the air now for Friday night, the 26th of February, 1999. Robert Blake is here one more time tonight. During the past four years, he has given us some of the better moments on this television program. And tonight, I trust he will do that again, along with Joe Quinnen from TV Guide, who the last time here gave us a great moment when he talked about boredom in America. Remember, he said he wanted to find out what was more boring than cats, and I said, what'd you find? And he said, John Tesh at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> Every time I see John Tesh, I think of Joe. He'll be back tonight along with Robert Blake and you on the, uh, the toll-free line. Years ago on radio, we did a show one night, and we said to people listening on the radio, what was one of the most embarrassing things that ever happened to you in your life? And a guy called up from San Francisco, and he, he recalled the story of when he and a date and another couple uh, went to a restaurant after going to a movie. And everybody went to the restroom to wash their hands and freshen up, and they all came back. And he realized during dinner that he was unzipped. So he reached beneath the table and zipped himself. And when it came time to leave, he left the booth and pulled the entire tablecloth with him and all the silverware. I got a charming uh, email from a lady yesterday who recalled as a precocious little girl going into the bathroom closet and finding there a box of sanitary napkins. And she went to her mother and she said, Mom, why do you have napkins in the bathroom? And mother said, well, dear, those are for very special occasions. Now put the clock ahead about six months. It's Thanksgiving dinner time, and the pastor and his wife are coming for dinner. And as mom and dad go to pick up the pastor, she says to the girl, by the way, would you set the table? And figuring it was a very special occasion, she got out the napkins, okay? <laughs> now the minister comes in. And she, here they are all the way around the table. And she says, you know, I had the fork on top of each napkin with the tail tucked away so nobody could see it, okay? <laughs> and her mother was horrified. And the minister said, what are those for? She said, a very special occasion. <laughs> That's very, very cute. <laughs> In any event, I have a long show tonight with Robert Blake and Joe Queenan and you on the toll-free. I'm Tom. You're watching CBS, and thanks for catching our pictures as we fly them through the air. Robert Blake is the Emmy Award-winning actor who's been in this business for almost 60 years. You'll recall him from series like Beretta and motion pictures, including In Cold Blood. We treasure Robert here for his forceful opinions on a variety of topics and his willingness to tell us exactly what is on his mind. And it's always a pleasure to welcome Mr. Robert Blake back to our show. Thank you for the nice things you said about me on Roseanne last week. That was very dear of you, and I appreciate it. Did I say anything nice you about you? You said something very nice about me. Well, I remember insulting the hell out of you and sitting down and saying, my God, he's a friend of mine. Why did I do that? And then I... <laughs> I watched no, an old I show we did at Channel 7 years ago that I can't show because I, I don't own it, where you made me stand up and take off my jacket and you said, look, he's got no ass. I probably could have done something like that. Yeah. But I, I had a flair. I mean, there was a, there was a charm about it, yes, right? Which absolutely. allowed you to not yes. smack me in the mouth. I did not smack you in the mouth because you did it with by. a smile on your face. My enhancing charm, wit, poise, and personality <laughs> has always held me in good stead when somebody's getting ready to take a baseball bat <laughs> to, your to head. get my attention. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you recall any embarrassing moments in your life? I told little stories at the beginning about people that had embarrassing moments. Have you ever been embarrassed in a social situation or public appearance? When I was very young, I used to get embarrassed a lot uh, because I had no social skills. I was never a kid, so I didn't know how to behave with kids. Right. I didn't know anything about taking somebody out, you know, dinner at eight and flowers and stuff mm -hmm. or a pajama party or a beach party. So I was always embarrassed. And when I was about 16, I suddenly laid so much of laws down to myself. Is there a fire over there? No, not at all. <laughs> I said to myself, you know, from now on, one thing I will never do, I will never explain myself to anybody. If I'm wrong, I'll apologize, but I'll never explain myself. And I will never be embarrassed again, because what I have, a lot of other people don't have. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to, you know, if I, but I, I went through some stuff. Yeah, I mean, I remember being in the ninth grade in high school when they took my pants off and ran them up the flagpole. <laughs> Did anybody salute? <laughs> and uh, stuff like that will yeah. get your attention. Yeah. You know, yeah. hey, little beaver, where's your feather? And nine guys want to come at you at one time yeah. and try to break your heart and stuff. And yeah, I got them, yeah. 
but not anymore. Anyway, not anymore. Good. Let me let me let me introduce a variety of topics here besides Robert Blake and get your opinions on them. Slightly. You know, things in the news. In fact, let's start with the news itself. <laughs> and the and the fact that television news today is controlled by business conglomerates, Rupert what Murdoch. News? Yeah. Uh, uh, what news? I. It's sad. It's sad to think that every American is stuck with Roger Mudd telling us who's going down on the president. That's what it's come to. I don't think Roger Mudd does that anymore. I Who doesn't? I, oh, okay. <laughs> but I, why did he get shot or something? No, but I, I don't he think there no I, I don't think Mr. Mudd is on the air on a news basis on a regular basis. But Tom if he Bro does a special, I'm sure it's on who's going down on the president. Okay. It's yes, like sir. <laughs> it's like they they got to keep you looking at something so you don't look at what's really going on. Aha. Uh -huh. You know, the country's being raped, the middle class is destroyed, the, the, the jobs are leaving the country, there's factories in South America, they're importing 9,000 Russians a day, and people are, oh, what's on the news? Oh, well, the president got his zipper caught. And of course it is, because news guys, I'm sure that news people would say to you, well, but we think that's interesting news. And we don't particularly care that Chrysler is building factories in South America and people are starving to death in the street. We think it's much more important who the president is laying. But do they have any choice? You know, when, when, when NBC is owned by, what, Time Warner, and Time Warner is owned by Matsushita, and it keeps going up oh, the ladder. Oh, 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 oh. NBC is owned by General Electric. And who owns General Electric? You got to go up the ladder. General Electric, I think, is a is no, a, no. General Electric is owned by by something else, and it's owned by something else. And I, you get up I, to like I, I, I don't think so, but I don't know for sure. Somebody do some research on yeah, that. Yeah, quick. Okay. I Find think out there's who, probably who's a half a dozen international conglomerates that ultimately own everything, and so how can you get anything that even remotely resembles news? I haven't seen any news, and I can't remember when. Well, we've seen, we, 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 we've seen some news, but you're correct when, when you say that there are stories that could, that, that could be told about jobs continuing to leave this country. Here's one that you don't hear covered at all. I have a friend who's in the oil business. Yeah. And I asked him one day, because now with computers, they can project almost anything, Bob, you know. I said, have you guys figured out when the world runs out of oil, when we lose the last drop of oil? He said, yeah, the year is 2045. Guess what, folks? That's 45 years away, and all the oil is gone. What happens then? Where's that on the news? No place. Mm -hmm. When you have one man who owns four or 5,000 newspapers, how are you going to... Where's the independence of a newscaster saying, tonight, I'm going to do a story on the fact that even though unemployment is up, wages are down and people down. are starving to death. Yeah, unemployment is down. But what does it mean? Well, you, you know, America, what made my America back in the 30s and the 40s, what made America different than any country on the planet was that we had a middle class. We went out and we formed unions and guilds and we became a middle class. A person could go to work in a factory for 20 years and they had all kinds of securities. Absolutely. They had the vacation. Listen, they had there, all, there, everything. There, there, there were GM families and Chrysler families, you know, fellows sure. and, who, and Firestone families. And, and my Corona. first president, who was Roosevelt, you know, a car in every garage and a chicken in every pot. Well, that was Hoover. And but... one person. No, no, no. No, Hoover. That was Roosevelt. Hoover. Roosevelt said a chicken in every pot. No, no, Hoover did a chicken in every pot, which is why he was not elected in 1932, because there were no chickens in the pots. You know, we ought to talk about show business, because you're correcting me about everything, and I can't even get off the ground here. <laughs> yeah, I don't mean I'm to correct you. I'm starting to feel like an idiot. <laughs> I'll you say, should correct me. I, I, I will say no more. Shall we talk about the little rascals or something that's easier no, no. that I'm comfortable uh, with? No, Talk about uh, t what happens to people who get famous like Mike Tyson and go nuts. Oh, isn't that sad? Very sad. Yeah, it's like, I was that way when I was doing Beretta. When you get to a place where everybody is telling you how wonderful you are, and you stop looking at yourself entirely, like, uh, like uh, uh, rock and roll stars, television stars, sports stars, athlete stars, you get to that place. I mean, there was a time when Tyson had Gus D'Amata 
Or maybe oh, that sure. wasn't who he had. No, maybe he no, had Donald Duck. No, he had I know he had somebody who watched <laughs> oh, out for his life. Uh, yeah. I don't know who it was, but you it was just somebody can't let it go, who you? took care you of his life. You just can't let it go. One of us okay. can't. <laughs> let, me, let me do a commercial and we'll okay. wrestle it to a draw, okay? All right. We'll be, we'll be right back with Robert Blake after this break. Jeez. I will tell you just one thing. We're talking about all that news stuff. Right. Wouldn't it be interesting if some Barbara Walters or somebody, instead of doing Monica Lewinsky, would do an in-depth study of why, was it four cops who shot that guy in New York? Three or four, I'm Three not sure. Three or four cops shot him 20 times, or if they all, you know, it's so easy to write it off as racism. Well, racism. But what is it that really makes? Now, when you think about it, here are guys, first of all, they're men. They're young men. Mm -hmm. They're white. They're Americans. And what better thing can you do? Uh, what, can, what, what better thing can you be in this world today than a young white male American? You got a better chance than anybody does of succeeding on the planet. What makes those guys commit suicide? by killing the guy. I mean, it's so easy to write off and say, yeah, well, it's racism, but they really committed, they ended their own lives yes, when they, they killed him. Yes, and it's so, did. and nobody wants to look at the madness that makes, it happened out here. That woman, that black woman in the car I and a bunch it. of cops blew her all to hell in, and God. Uh, in uh, Riverside. And ended their lives. What kind of people want to be cops today? Why do they want to get their hands on those guns and why does this kind of a disaster happen? Those are profound questions. Yes, they I are. I mean, it's easy for, for Farrakhan and all those people to say, well, it's racism. And once we get rid of racism, there won't be insanity. But I say the insanity is far beyond the racism. I mean, I know cops who are racist for 20 or 30 years, and they beat up black guys and stuff like that. They never even get caught. But here are young men who have... Every advantage on the planet. Like I said, you can't be anything better today and than that. And who take an oath and swear to serve the public interest and the public good, right? What kind of people are wanting to be cops in the first place? What kind of people are applying for the gig? Okay, and also what kinds of situations do the officers find themselves in when these kinds of terrible atrocities happen? Well, there's that too. Yeah. Because when I was a kid, it was great to be a cop. And it wasn't a terribly difficult job. There were good guys and bad guys. Right. What happens today is the more our society is running on empty, the more we've become a bunch of hit-and-run lunatics who have no respect for each other, the more we dump it on the cops. Now they're responsible for all kinds of social problems. That's right. Husbands and wives beating each other Domestic up. They're problems. responsible for drug problems. That's another whole joke of the century. The war, the war the on drugs. The drug war is a joke. But, but, but before we get to that, I don't want to get too far from Mike Tyson and why some famous people take themselves out. And, you know, Tyson has effectively killed himself by, by, by his behavior. And you were saying when he was with Gus D'Amato, he, he was a, a, a disciplined fighter yeah. and... Yeah. and, and uh, he had somebody who loved him, mm -hmm. somebody who cared whether he lived or died. And who guided him. Yeah. Was his guardian angel, so to speak. For his life. I had that guy in my life. Really? When I was a young man, I came out of the Army, and I went back to work, and boy, I was crazy. I mean, I got in a lot of trouble. I was blacklisted for almost two years. I smacked a director, and I got fired from another job, and all of a sudden, the phone wasn't ringing. So I went back to work, and Richard Boone, remember Richard Boone? Sure. He said, Robert, you are going to stay in this business. You're going to wind up on death row or in prison, because you ain't going to make it. And he took me by the ear. This was like 1960. And he drug me to his lawyer. His name was Lou Goldman. Lou Goldman. Now, Lou Goldman handled every wild man in the business. He had Lee Marvin. He had <laughs> Tony Quinn, Jimmy Coburn, <laughs> Steve McQueen, uh -huh. Lee Cobb. He had every guy. Wild guy in the business. And yep. he was Gus DeMotta. He took me under his wing. He said, Robert, you have to listen to me, otherwise you're never going to make it. And somehow he had the, the emotional and the psychological wherewithal to get me to respect and love him. Right. 
to rein you in, first of all, and, he, and point you in the right direction. He kept me out of the courtrooms. Many of the time he went back in the judge's chambers and drug me back there and solved a problem that was going to turn into a nightmare, came on the sets and handled things, went to Lou, to Lou Wasserman's office and said, don't worry, I'll handle it, I'll fix it. And, what would and he I'm say, still here. And what would he say to you if, if, you'd, if you'd gotten yourself in trouble? Like, hey, Robert, what the hell are you doing? For some reason or other, I listened to him. Mm -hmm. When I was with him, I was like a little boy. And I would apologize. I'd say, God, Lou, I'm sorry. I, um, he had a way of getting to your heart mm -hmm. so that the junkyard dog was not there Got you. Got with you. him. And he took care of all of us in that way. I was very lucky. He got me a business manager who made me a rich man. So you saved some money. Because Lou insisted that I do what the business manager said. Live in a small house, drive a regular car. Because he said, if you ever get to the point where you've got to hold your hat in your hand and walk in somebody's office and say, please, you're going to kill him. So we've got to make you financially independent as soon as possible. He took me out of situations that I shouldn't have been in. He flew to Europe and cleared up a situation that I could have, God knows what would have happened. Could you tell us what the situation was? I was working on a movie. And uh, very quickly, very briefly, when, when you take a real gunshot in the chest or someplace, first they put metal on you. Because this was a small movie and I was doing my own stunts and stuff. First they put metal on you, then they put the leather thing with the explosive. Gotcha. So when they push the button, the explosive all comes out here mm -hmm. because the metal thing keeps it from coming here. Right. Well, it was late and everybody was working fast and they forgot to put the metal on me. So they hit the button and the leather blew into my chest and I blew backward and I saw stars. I went crazy. And I came up swinging and screaming at everybody. I, I couldn't get my hands on the, the, the special effects guy, so I hit the makeup man. I hit anybody I could. I went nuts. Mm -hmm. And it was a big scene, and it was a terrible scene. And I didn't, work on the, I didn't want to work on the movie anymore. And cops came and everything. Lou flew there. Enter Mr. Goldman. Talked to everybody. Talked to me. Made me go apologize. Made the other people apologize to me for not hanging them. And we got through the movie and very stuff good, like that. Good. Here's Kate on the toll-free in Indianapolis. Hi, Kate. You're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, well, I'm your number one fan. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. You're welcome. Um, I was just wondering um, if Robert was... If Robert was... Um, well, if he ever thought of running for office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, my Lord. What a lovely, sweet thing, and I certainly am not <laughs> laughing at you. But <laughs> well, if anyone not. ever dug into my past, I mean, even if I ran for dog catcher, they <laughs> wouldn't have to go back five years to disqualify me from everything under the sun. <laughs> no, I've, I've been very, very politically active in my life, and when I believed in politics uh, and fought, I mean, I, you know, for, for, for Jack Kennedy to be president and a lot of things uh -huh. like that. But I just think that politics today, I couldn't call it a joke because it's much too serious and much too pathetic to be a joke. Yeah. But politicians are owned by the same people that own NBC and all that stuff, and the store is pretty pathetic. I don't know why I'm looking down at the speaker, because that's where the voice is coming yeah, from. <laughs> but she's looking at you right here. In any event, okay. Kate, I don't think Robert Blake is, has any political plans to run for office. No, darling. Well, I agreed with what you said earlier. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad well, you with, called. I'm sorry? With, um, well, I think you should, well, I would vote for you. <laughs> Thank because you. I believe in, well, you were saying earlier, well, I think you should just run and then build, well, just own yourself. Own the, <laughs> you know, you don't need anyone to govern you. Right, I you gotta are. tell you. Kate, Kate, I'm glad you called, and thank you very kindly for watching. I have to do a fast break here. Do We're a break. chatting with Robert Blake. We'll okay. be right back after these messages.
all to make that money before well, I go collect Robert Blake, a quarter who, when, he, who, who, when he was 16 years old, made rules for himself. That's right. I will never stand in line. Never. When I leave the Army? Ever. Never. never. You, you do, obviously, you don't go to Disneyland. I don't care where I go. No I don't line. stand in line. If there's a line there, what do you do? I, anything I would have to. I take $500 out of my pocket and give it to everybody in the line so I'll get in front. <laughs> I won't stand in line. I don't care if God says, if you stand in line, Robert, you get 10 more years, I'd say, where do I die? I ain't standing in line. Uh, I ain't standing in line. I don't okay. explain myself. I won't collect unemployment. You will not collect unemployment. I don't care if I got to get a gun and rob an old blind lady on the corner. Mm -hmm. I don't go in there. Boy, when you have to sit down at a table, with a lady on the other side chewing some gum and say, what did you do to find a job this week? And I say, well, I did four years on Beretta, but I don't have a job this week. Well, what is, well how, do, how do you actors get jobs anyway? What do you do? Do you call people? Because we got a list of things here. I say, well, guess what? You can take your list and your gum and your pencil and put them all in gerbil heaven. Because I ain't going to sit here and listen to your jive ass self anymore. Uh -huh. I will go to a pool room and shoot nine ball for a quarter a game before I wait for your $65. Mm -hmm. And uh, rule number three, I will park any place I please. I will park any place I please, please. and pay the tickets. Uh -huh. Once again, if I got to go shoot pool to get the money, I don't care if there's a church and they're carrying a dead guy out. <laughs> I will park in the red zone and say, tell that stiff to turn the corner because I'm parked right here. But we have the hearse. I don't give a shit. God, I'm parked here, and I'll pay the ticket. Uh -huh. Those are certain things that I have to do you know, a to lot get of, through a, my life. Yeah, a lot of people march to their own drum, but you've got a band out there playing somewhere, and you're the only guy in the world who it hears it, which is, by the way, I salute you dissident for dissident to somebody else, yeah. but it gets me through the world. <laughs> it gets me through the world. And I thank God for Lou Goldman, because he was right. Like, if I had to walk in somebody's office and say, please, will you hire me to do those four lines? because that other actor you had just fell over dead, and I'm sure I could do those lines. And they say, well, what have you done lately? I'll tell you, that's a new gag now. Some people a while back said, you want to do this movie? I said, I don't know, man. They said, well, go to New York and meet the director, and the people will pay for everything. You'll stay at your favorite hotel. No problems. Mm -hmm. Just meet them and talk to them. I said, OK, what have I got to lose? I got a girlfriend in New York. I'll go say hello. What's going on? Right. I go to New York. They send a car to the hotel. They take me over to meet the director. I walk in, and uh, there's a lady sitting at the desk. And she says, uh, I'm a so-and-so. I'm the casting person. Where is your uh, reel? I said, what are you talking about, reel? Oh, oh your demonstration. She said, your tape. Yeah, demonstration reel, yeah. My tape? My tape? I've been acting for 60 years. I got to have a tape? So being very cool. I took out $20 and I threw it on the desk. I said, honey, go rent the following movies. And those are my tapes. In the meantime, I'll be in Los Angeles and you can put this movie where the sun don't shine. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And a gerbil head. I went home. Yeah. A tape. Actor got to have a tape, tape now to get a job? Give me the script and let me show you what I can do. What a tape. Anyway. So I didn't, I didn't do that job. R rule number four, he carries no tapes. I don't have a tape. <laughs> I don't have a tape. And if you want a picture of me, just go out with a Polaroid and find a horse that just took a dump and shoot the manure. That's the picture you can have of me. <laughs> what the hell is acting about, anyway? If I had a start today, I would. You know what I advise young people to do today? Go to Canada. Oh, really? And work in Canada. Go to Australia, where they need actors. They don't need actors in this town. You got to read 35 times and show them a tape to get three lines on some piece of trash. We used to walk in, three people go in and say, OK, you read first, you read second, you read third. 20 minutes later, you knew whether you got the job exactly or not. Exactly right. You get the job, you, you two don't. You either go to wardrobe or you go home. Yeah, exactly. Now, what, what is your next project, your next uh, acting project? Is that lined up yet? Lord willing, and the creeks don't rise. I will make a couple of small films before they plant me. I'm never going to go do another, what the hell was the name of that thing with Wesley Snipes and all them people, Money Train. Mm -hmm. 
Never one of them big epics where you sit. Where's Mr. Blake? In about an hour and a half, we need him for 30 seconds. In the meantime, I couldn't, are you kidding, man? With, they have these banks of TV monitors. Over there, there's like 25 screens. And as soon as you do a scene, you say, cut. Woody Harrelson, everybody runs over to look at themselves. Really? What the hell are you watching? They, it used to be that when you worked, right behind the camera was your audience. The director, the cameraman, everybody was helping you. They were the people that you just, you felt that cook. I have a, George Stevens used to actually touch you in a close-up. If you did a close-up, Stevens would right be there. Yeah. Dealing with you. Now, you're in front of the camera, and you know what's behind the camera? Not a soul. No, robotic camera. Nobody's there. Everybody. Everybody's over watching the thing. The thing, that's the, the and monitors. And there's a little girl with a little microphone who'll walk up to you and say, the director would like you to do it. What director? He's over there. And he's talking to her through this little piece of junk. And you're dealing with a girl that's a messenger for the director. Can, can I ask you a very direct question? Certainly. Do you I'll. have screw you money? I have all my life. Good. Ever since I was two years old and I walked in front of people and they threw money when I sang and danced, mm -hmm. I've never, ever cared about money. Because when push comes to shove, I will get a dollar. You know, it's like you say, when everybody starts shooting, I'll be the last one standing. Mm -hmm. If there's one job in this town and a million people and I need the gig, I'll get it. There's no way in the world I'm ever going to need money that I can't get my hands on. Okay. Because I've fallen off of horses for money. I've done a lot of things nobody will ever know I've done for money. And so I, technically now, I have enough money to sit in my front room till hell freezes over. But when I didn't, I still had screw you money because I could always go get it someplace. Good for you. I'd rather, if you're the producer and I don't like what's going on and I want to act for you, I'd rather go over there and fall off a horse for $100 for a guy that I like than wind up with 25 people watching themselves on a monitor. The reason that you will get the job if one million other people get it is you'll park exactly where you want. They'll, they'll all be looking for a parking place. You'll park exactly where you want. And you know what? I ain't half bad at what they pay me to do. Like when I was in the Army, everybody hated me. But nobody could take a machine gun apart faster than me. Nobody could put it together faster than me. I could do it in my sleep. I could do it underwater. And I could hit anything between here and Mars. So they had to put up with me. And that's a little bit true of acting. Because, you know, nobody cares if you're nice to the makeup man. There are no subtitles on the screen that say he's a lousy actor, but we love him because he was a sweet guy. Mm -hmm. There are no subtitles anywhere. All that counts is what's on the box, because that's all there is. And if you look at work that I did when I was 10 years old or when I was 60 years old, there's very few times where you can say, well, we don't want to hire him because he's no good. People will say, we don't want to hire him because we're a little bit scared that he might be something more than a robot. And we want robots. So we might not hire him. Robots you ain't, pal. Man, Thanks for the memories. Court. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for being a buddy, okay? And I got a hunch that you and I have a destiny somewhere in the future. We'll see. Okay. Take care, my friend. Thank you. Robert Blake is the guest. Uh, and go rent the pictures. Uh, <laughs> next, Joe Quinion from TV Guide right after this short break. Mr. Kenny and I were just saying that whenever we stay in hotels, we always have a very, very nice time, especially when the company is paying. Yeah. Expense account hotels are good things. On Monday, Gloria Stewart is here. Remember the lady who was one of the stars of the Titanic, uh, who was a nominee for Best Supporting Actor? And then our old friend Jeffrey Tubin, better known as the, uh, as the uh, Tubester, uh, will join us to discuss whether or not O.J. Simpson is guilty. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. We'll, we'll, we'll move on to other things. Blessed are the flexible, for they can tie themselves into knots. Have a good weekend, everybody. Good night, all. <laughs>